Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm glad you were able to make time uh, to come and hear God's Word and be challenged from God's Word. Um, the song Aaron just finished up, Make Me a Blessing, that was a song that was really powerful to me um, in my late teens and early 20s as I was trying to find God's will for my life. And I found myself singing that song a lot, especially the chorus as I was doing things for God and serving for God. And may God make us all a blessing, one to another, especially even more so during this time of not being able to be together and social distancing. And this morning's message will be dealing with also with God's working in our prayer life. And that ties into as God wants us to be more in prayer for each other and for his power and his will to be done. And so i like to open up in a word of prayer. And as we pray, ask God also as the message is preached that it would speak to your heart and challenge you in your own prayer life. So let's pray. Father, we pray, Father, for uh, Maria, that you would be with her from the car accident, Father, help her to heal. We pray for Yvonne, Lord, help her to heal from um, her fall, Lord, and her broken leg. And Lord, we pray for our essential workers that have to be out there on a regular basis. We pray you keep them uh, safe and healthy, especially those of our church and the family members of our church, Lord. And we pray, Father, for those who are facing financial issues through the the problems that are going on and right now with not being able to work or income not being able to come in, especially for small businesses, Father. Many of them may not recover from uh, this situation, and we pray that you'd be with the owners of those and the workers of those small businesses, Father, that things, once they get started back up, they would be able to get their business going again, Lord, and get back on their feet. And we pray, Lord, for those who are sick and those who are ill um, right now during this time, and we pray you help them to feel better. And Help their bodies to fight off the, uh, the things that they're dealing with, Lord. And we pray, Father, for the gospel. We pray for the word of God, the power of the gospel, that it would reach the hearts of the lost, and that the word of God would edify, encourage, strengthen, and help the believers to be busy about your work, with seeking to edify one another and to bring praise and honor and glory to your name. Father, we pray that your will will be done now as we study about prayer, that you would help us to grow from that, and help us to increase in our own prayer life for you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse 9. Colossians 1 verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened 
with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in his light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So if I ask you, if a person desires to be a medical doctor, what must they do? You might be saying, well, they need to go to school. But is going to school and just getting knowledge enough for someone to be a medical doctor? How many of you would want a surgeon to operate on you with never having been in an operating room at all? But they have the head knowledge. But how many of you would be willing to go underneath that knife? What if a person wants to be a collector of rare coins? How are they supposed to do that? What if someone wants to work on car engines? They can look through books and pictures. And today we have all these videos we're able to watch, which do help a whole lot. But to be able to do something is more than just head knowledge. We actually have to do it. What about someone who wants to be great at math or any other subject? With each of these persons, there needs to be a willing to study and to learn. But just getting a bunch of head knowledge and not putting into practice does very little good. Paul knows that for a person to become like Christ, they must first learn what it is to be like Christ. But then also, that we need not just have a bunch of head knowledge, but we need to put it into practice. So let's look at Paul's prayer for the, Col a church, the Colossians, the church at Colossae, as he prays for they grow in knowledge and understanding of God. But not just growing in knowledge and understanding, but they would put it into practice into their lives. Helping one another, encouraging one another, seeking to use what they have learned about God and about Christ from God's Word and applying it to their life as they live it out on a daily basis, day in and day out. So what do you do when you hear about someone going through a problem, a believer, something they face in life? Do you make time to pray for them? Well, verse 9a says that we should be praying as soon as we hear news of another believer and they're going through some kind of struggle. So often we pray for those who are sick or those who are in need. There's nothing wrong with that, as Paul also prays for that. But Paul shows us here that prayers need to be more than just praying for people to be out of their problems. He wants us to pray that God works in their lives. When do we ever get into the place where we're no longer needing to grow in our knowledge and wisdom and, and of Jesus Christ and of God's Word? Is there a time that we ever get where we no longer need to grow? You're probably at home, some of you are saying, well, uh, maybe when I die and go to heaven, and that would be the correct answer. Until we pass from this life and go to heaven to be with the Lord, and when we're no longer bound from being limited in our knowledge. Until that day happens, whether we're five years old, 20 years old, 50 years old, 100 years old, and I don't know if anyone's listening that's over 100 years old, but once you get over 100 years old, you still need to grow. As long as your brain is able to function, you need to be studying and learning from God's Word. And that has to continue until the day we die. So Paul is praying that they grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He wants them to grow. He wants them to, to, to mature in their knowledge and understanding. He says that it is part of the will of God for us to grow in our relationship with Christ and our knowledge. So we're either being filled with the Spirit or we're not being filled with the Spirit. There's no in-between. And so part of being filled with the Spirit is wanting to study God's Word. Part of being filled with the Spirit is applying what we have learned about God's Word. So then we come to the second part of 9. You should be not just 
giving up on praying for others. So often we may get frustrated because God doesn't answer our prayer requests on our time zone or our time of period. But we should keep praying until God either tells us yes, no, because there may be a maybe or wait for a little while. And so until we have an exact answer, yes or no, we need to keep praying. So along similar lines, when do we stop praying for someone who's asked us to pray for them? It's either when they have told us their prayer request has been answered, whether yes or no, or until maybe that person has passed away. At that point, we can't do anything. Nothing can change. Because whatever they have determined in this life will determine what happens in the life hereafter. So when do we stop praying for someone to get saved? Well, the Bible says God desires for all to be saved, so we keep praying for that person to get saved until they pass away. When do we stop praying for a believer to get their faith right with God? God desires for all believers to walk faithfully with him, so we keep praying for that believer to get right with God until the point they pass away. So when do we stop praying for God to heal someone? We keep praying for God to heal someone unless there's a clear evidence that God's not going to heal them or until they pass away. So when do we stop praying to help one another in the church? And, and when do we stop praying that we want others to grow in Christ? And pray that we grow in Christ. When should that prayer request stop? It should not stop until they pass away or until we pass away. We should be continually praying, asking God to help others to grow in Christ and that we would grow in Christ. So when should we stop asking God to bless our country? Until God says he's no longer going to do it or until our country's no longer here. We keep praying and asking God to bless our country. When do we stop asking God to bless people across the world, especially Christians across the world who are suffering? We keep praying. When do we stop praying for God to, to, to work in the lives of the people of Israel since they are clearly near to his heart? We keep praying for God to work for the people of Israel. So we should be praying for others on a regular basis. So how often do you pray for others outside of your immediate family. How often do you pray for others to grow in the relationship with Christ? How often do you pray for God to do that in your own life? God, I, I really need to grow in my knowledge. Please help me today when I study your word that you would help me see something that I need to learn and to apply to my life. How often do you pray that God is leading in the lives of those who are close to you? So often, again, we pray for God to remove problems instead of saying, God, if you can remove this problem, great. But if this problem is for someone to grow in their relationship with you or for you to wake them up, use that problem, whatever that situation they're facing, use it to help them to grow in their relationship with you and become more like Christ. Also, for the same thing for us when we face problems and struggles. Do you want to see God work? And do you want to learn more about God? Do you want others to see, to see God working in their life and learn about God? They need to be asking God on a regular basis to do that. So maybe you pray daily. Or at least you have a desire to do so. So what are some things you can pray about others? You can think about it. One of the things we need to be praying about others is that they grow in their relationship and that God helps them to conform, to become like Christ and be used for the glory of God. So when you pray for others, what is your focus of your prayers? Paul focuses on this in the last part of verse 9. He gives us three things. God's will, grow in wisdom, and grow in spiritual awareness. So the first one, his will. So often when we do pray for God to make life easier for someone else, we ask him to remove the sickness or the hardship, but we don't ask for God's will to be done in the situation. Or God will show what his desire is through what they face. Very seldom any of us, to be honest, that we pray for God to use something specifically for his will to help the person to become like Christ. 
The second thing Paul again hits is wisdom. When was the last time you asked God for wisdom in needing to make a decision? When was the last time you asked God to increase another believer's knowledge and wisdom and that he would use it in their life to be a blessing and become more like Christ? And then the spiritual awareness. When was the last time you asked God to help you or someone else to become more like Christ? When we think about Christ's life, it wasn't a life that was full of happiness and pleasure and fun. There was a lot of suffering there. And through his suffering and through his problems he faced, we find salvation. To know what God's desire for you and another or a situation, we should be asking him to help us to see that, help us to learn from it, to, to, to ask him, please, please, what can we do, God, to please you through this? What can we do, God, to give you glory through this? What can help this person as they're facing this, Father, to, to use it for your glory? So we need to pray for God to help us to have spiritual insight into things we face in life and for others. And pray for others' eyes to be spiritually open, especially the lost, but also for believers. We know of believers who, who just are just not following God's will, and we need to ask God to help them to see your will, Lord. Help them to learn from your word and your Holy Spirit to live for you in a way that honors you. And then we come to verse 10. Paul talks about the purpose of asking God to fill them with the knowledge. Not just to be filled with knowledge for no reason. He focuses more on to be more like Christ, to live more like Christ in verse 10. So walking with a desire to please God with our choices and our actions is the first thing It's here in verse 10. And this Greek word talks about desiring and pleasing. It talks about doing it in all things and completing all things in such a way that's pleasing to God. When we pray, are we really wanting God to do what is best for the person and for their life and our life to make them more like Christ? Or are we more concerned about life being easier for them and easier for us? If we're all honest, we a lot of times pray more for things to be easier than for God to use it for his honor and for his glory. When we choose to harbor sin in our hearts and our minds, we're not living for God like we should. And, and it hinders our prayer life. It hinders us to focus on praying what God wants us to pray for. When we hate someone or we seek that they could have something bad happen to them, or we use our words in a way that, that, that puts a person down or cuts a person, we need to use the Christ-like attitude and change those sinful behaviors and, and seek to do things that pleases God because it hinders our prayer life when we behave that way. As we study and learn God's word, we become more accountable for our actions and our thoughts. The more we study God's word, the more we should be putting into practice what we have learned as we study God's word and putting into practice into daily life. It does us no good to study how to be more like Christ and not live it out. God's word is for the purpose of us living it. He wants us to know it, but he wants us to live it, to put it into practice. Um, in in the, the letter that James writes, uh, the brother of Jesus, he talks about this situation that a man looks into a pool or a mirror or some kind of reflective me metal, and he's looking into it, and he's seeing his image, and as he's looking at his image in that, he, he sees some things that need to be fixed, like your hair. I have hair trouble every morning, as most of you know. As you see these images, maybe there's a place that you have to put a little bit of makeup on, or your hair's a little bit out of place, or there's mud or dirt, or some of you may still have on your face, egg, from breakfast. He says, when you look in the mirror and you see these things, what should you do? You should fix it. That's what James says. But he says that some people look into this and they see these problems, they see these things that need to be fixed, and they either don't act like they see them, or they look so quickly and then look away and they forget what they need to change. 
It ties us into God's word. When we look into God's word and we see there's something we should be changing, when should we do start working on that change? It should be immediately. We shouldn't just wait and say, well, I will do it next week, or I'll do it a year from now, or when I get older, I'll, I'll stop behaving and, and, and sowing my wild oats. I'll do all that later on, God. I'm not going to worry about doing it now. No, James says when you see it, address it. As we see God's Word teach us things, we need to address it. And Paul is saying that he wants us to immediately start living like Christ, that, that our desires and our choices are done for such a way to please and bring honor to God. He also addresses that the purpose of this praying of this knowledge is not just for head knowledge, but for them to start bearing much fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Another reason Paul was praying again for the Colossians was to increase their knowledge for the purpose of bearing more fruit. Spiritual fruit, such as loving one another. That's hard to do when someone's unloving to you, isn't it? Forgiving one another. Well, I'm not going to forgive them. You don't know what they've done to me. What has God forgiven you for? Maybe there right now there's been a situation and maybe it's happened with you this morning with a family member, a friend, or a neighbor, and you've sinned against them. Well, you need to go ask them to forgive you, and hopefully they will forgive you. But if someone's asked you to forgive them for something they have done wrong, why can we say we won't forgive them when God has forgiven us for so much? So Paul prays for this fruit of forgiveness, this fruit of being willing to pray for one another as God wants to work in their life. And for being an encouragement to one another as we serve and, and live for God. As the song says, make me a blessing to someone today. Using our gifts and our talents and our abilities not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the whole church. Even that church member that you don't like. Or that person who is saved who you just can't get along with. We're supposed to use our gifts and our talents for the family of God. Again, we don't get to choose who's a part of the family of God. And then another purpose that, God, uh, that Paul brings out in verse 10 is increasing their knowledge was to increase their desire. So as we study God's word and we learn God's word, it should increase the desire in us to do what? To want to know more about God's word. And, he's, and so there should be that desire in all of us, and that desire should be there until the day we die. A desire to grow more in God's word. Paul desired for the Colossians to increase their knowledge so that they would create a greater desire to learn more about God. And that same desire to learn more about God would be contagious that other people would learn more about God. Many of you have children or grandchildren at home right now more than you really want. And they may be getting on your nerves. One thing we know about kids is they ask a lot of questions. They want to learn and to know more. There are times, to be honest, our boys can sometimes drive us crazy. They, they want to know more. They want to gain knowledge. They want to have a greater understanding of how things work or how things process. But sometimes the questions are so much that it just about drives us nuts. Especially if you're stuck in a vehicle traveling on a four or five hour trip and they're asking questions about every minute about this or that or what that building's for, what this building's for, or how fast are we going, or how long will it be there, or what's the distance, what's the amount of gas we're using, where are we going to stop the eat, can I go to the bathroom, all that drives us nuts. But Paul's desire is for us, though, to have that same desire of learning and understanding and asking questions as we go to God's Word. And he doesn't get annoyed with us asking him questions, as we do sometimes as parents and grandparents. God wants us to go to his Word and say, God, why is this passage here for? God, I just don't understand what they're saying here. Please help me. And, and, and we're told that God has given us just more than just his Word. He's given us his Holy Spirit to help us understand. And we're also told by, told by Paul that he is giving us teachers and preachers and pastors and, and, and other people that they can be mentors to help guide us and direct us, to edify us, to help us to grow. And we need to be asking and learning and, and, and just wanting to know more about God, just like a child does about things. 
And again, God does not get annoyed by us asking questions. He wants us to know. He wants us to grow. He wants us to have understanding. God desires for us to, to have a deep longing to know him more intimately, more deeper tomorrow than we have today, and today more than we did yesterday. He, he wants us to know how he wants us to live. He wants us to know how we can seek to please him with our lives. Those who long to know God and to know God's will in their lives, they continue to desire to know more. Those who are satisfied with their learning and their knowledge of God will slowly lose interest in learning more and knowing more about God. You see, there can be a person who's been saved 50, 60 years, and they only have what we call the simple, basic knowledge of who God is. We call it like the milk of the word. They only desire just to know the basics of salvation, a little bit about who God is, and that's enough for them. But then you have another person who's only been saved a year or two. And they have this longing to know God and a desire to know God's word and a desire for God's word to change it. And they're, and, and they're just soaking it up like a sponge. No matter how much is coming to them, they just want more, they want more, they want more of knowing about God. A person like that, even though they've only been saved a year or two, would know more about God than a person who's been saved 50 or 60 years who has never really had an interest to learn more about God other than salvation. Which of the two you think is serving God more? The person who is just recently saved and learning from God's word. It's sad, but it's true. Paul then comes to verse 11. He also desires through his prayer that the Colossians would be so encouraged and so strengthened in the faith that they would stand for the truths of God's word even in difficult times. So when I say the word all power, what comes to your mind? Paul's prayer was for the all-powerful God to provide strength and power for all believers, not just for the Colossians. You know, as he was praying that, that applies to you even today. Wow. His prayer request from long, long ago for the Colossians church also included you today. Isn't that nice to know that God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever? There are things in God's word that may not apply to us today that apply to a different time point. But God's word is for all of us. There's something we can learn from every portion of scripture and Paul's desire was for you today to learn from God's word, that you would experience the power of God through his word lived out in your life. Again, Paul was praying for strength and power was so that believers would be able to continue to witness and share the gospel and live in a way that brings others to Christ, even in the face of severe persecution so that they can bring glory to the name of God. Paul desired in his prayer was for the power and strength and might to be provided by God was for the purpose to enable them to stand firm, stand fast in their faith, and be able to witness and share the gospel. He also wanted it to bring joy and peace. And joy and patience. He wanted them to experience the joy that comes from serving God even in difficult times. Even today, there are many Christians in parts of this world, mostly in the Middle East and over in parts of Asia, that face severe persecution day in and day out just because they know Christ as their Savior. Isn't it nice we live in the country we live in? That we have a freedom to worship even this morning, even though we can't be together physically, we can still worship together, we can still pray for one another, we can still encourage one another by calls and cards, dropping off food, just seeing someone need something. Other parts of the world, they cannot experience that. They're not allowed to be open about their faith. What a blessing that even today, even as difficult it might be, having to be in our homes to listen to a message, we are able to worship freely. And to live out our faith freely. 
So we should be praying for God to encourage our other brothers and sisters in Christ who don't have those freedoms, that they can stand strong for the faith, that they can stand strong and steadfast for the gospel. There are members even in our church who have family members who mock them and belittle them and tease them because of their faith. We have people in our church who go to work daily and, and they're made fun of because of their Christian walk. We have people throughout the area in their neighborhoods where they're trying to do what's right and, and, and their neighbors are making it difficult on them. We need to be praying for one another. Even here, even though we don't face the persecution that other Christians are in other parts of the world, we do have people. And maybe you're one this morning. You just had a difficult time this past week, this past month, or even this year where you have someone who is really making life hard on you because of your faith. Find a brother or sister in Christ and ask them to help pray for you that you can stand fast and firm and stand for Christ as he stood for you and died for you on that cross and rose again. So then Paul again returns to the major theme of chapter 1, thanksgiving and thankfulness. Paul states that a believer's qualification to be part of the family of God has been provided by God. All someone has to do, if you're listening this morning, you have not done it, has to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And if they believe that, then they're part of the family of God. And so therefore, we need to be thankful for God for saving those of us who are saved and placing us into the body of Christ. And thankful for the family of God. Again, we do not get to choose who's of our family. It says your physical family, you don't get to pick who your brothers and sisters are growing up. You don't get to pick who your cousins are. You don't get to pick who's a part of your family of God. And Paul brings us back to that theme that we need to be thankful for one another. Not all of us have the same duties and abilities. But all of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ, we have gifts and talents that need to be used for the glory of God. Used to edify and encourage the family of God. When we get to heaven, none of us will... Have a, a, have a desire to say, well, I just didn't like that person on earth, and I wish they were not in heaven now with me. We won't say that. The problems we have here on earth won't matter when we get to heaven. And the person who you don't like right now that's saved, they're going to be a part of your family forever in heaven. And so you might as well get along with them now while you can, because you're going to have to do it for eternity when you get to heaven. So God saved us all from the power of sin. He saved us all from the penalty of sin. And we have a possession in Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ, a part of us, and the part of the love of God that he has bestowed upon us. And we are to share that with others. We are a part of Christ who is our salvation, our redemption, from the sin and forgiveness of the penalty of sin. We're a part of Christ. We're part of his body. So how's your prayer life? If you're part of our church family and you didn't get the text about prayer requests that we sent out, please let me know and I can mail you a copy of it. We all need to be praying for one another and encouraging one another. So how often do you pray for others in the church? Where are you personally in your knowledge of God? Have you got to that point where it says, I just don't want to learn anymore? I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to look at God's word. I'm not going to listen to any messages. I am good because I'm saved. That's all I want. No. Your desire should be, I need to learn more. I need to know more. I want to grow in my relationship and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not just to get the head knowledge, but so we can live it out amongst each other. That should be our desire. A sign of a spiritual, or as Paul is going to be dealing with, a church that, that, that is growing, is a church that is praying for one another. A church that's using their gifts and their abilities for the benefit and the blessing of each other for the glory of God. So if you're saved, you're a part of the body of Christ. And if you don't have a local church, find a local church. If you're close by, join our local church. But use your gifts and your talents and your abilities for the glory of God. Remember, if a person wants to be good at something, 
first need to put time in to learn about it. But then they also have to put it in practice. The same, again, is with our Christian walk. To become more like Christ, you must put in the time and to truly study in Christ and God's Word. And then you have to put into practice what you have learned. And think about this. What does a prophet a man who spends his whole time studying about fishing poles and fishing lines and types of hooks and sinkers, and he has all these exp expensive fishing poles he has, he has them in his garage, and they just sit there? They might look nice. They may be really pretty. But he's never used them to fish with. Is there any benefit in that? What about a woman who learns and, and, and studies and, and, and learns how to knit and to sew and to do things like that, but she never does it ever? She never has made her first little garment. There's no benefit in that. Again, we need to be careful we're not just seeking a bunch of head knowledge just for the head knowledge. So maybe we get in a discussion with someone, we can have a theological discussion, an argument with them because we know more scripture than they do. No, we need to be able to know it so we can apply it and live it out. Spending time in prayer for each other and using God's word and our talents and our gifts to edify one another and to encourage one another. So who? Walking with Christ first starts with us getting saved and then learning about what God's Word has to say. But again, head knowledge is more than just allowing it to be in our head. It has to become part of our heart and our desire to live it out. To live out what we have learned about God in such a way that we bring glory and honor to God. And use what gifts and talents and abilities we have in God's Word to edify, to help, to encourage one another. So how are you doing at that? If you've been failing at it, ask God here in a little bit to help you to do better. If you got to the point where you're no longer wanting to study God's Word or learn from God's Word, ask God to help you to have that desire. Like a person who's only been saved a year or two, and they're just growing leaps and bounds over studying God's Word. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we pray again for those who are hurting, for the, those who are struggling, for those who are out and, and, and about on a regular basis. You keep them safe and we pray again, Father, for Maria and for Yvonne. You help both of them to heal from their surgeries, Lord. And we pray, Father, for again, for all of us, that we would do our part to honor you and to serve you and to bring glory to your name. Help us to pray for one another on a regular basis. And Lord, may your power and your will, even through these difficult times, that the gospel would spread and reach those who are lost, that they would come to know Christ and allow your word to edify and to encourage believers to be more like Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and God bless.